introduce himself, and I'm sure that you're very familiar with Peter and his work. Thanks very much, thank you. Um, can, can you hear me at the back? Yeah, right, good, okay. I just love some of the terminology around this event, the meaningful ramble. Uh, yeah. Anyone going on a meaningful ramble? I might not come back. <laughs> um, and I also understand that, that, all the, that all the decorations and so on have been done by people preparing for this, which is tremendous. And it looks, it looks really good. Um, it, someone mentioned at the back, uh, James, that. Uh, that the, at the Tizog Centre, where I'm from, um, at the University of Kent, we used to, our offices used to be in, in huts, in wooden huts. They were actually much less salubrious than these people. <laughs> <laughs> and they had things growing through the walls and things like that. This is much, much flashier. So, this is uh, luxury. Yeah, that's right, exactly. This is the luxury hut. Um, so, uh, it, it's quite, uh, it takes me back a bit to, uh, we, we also did our teaching in, in huts. Uh, a bit like this in, in the past too. Uh, anyone been to the been to those old huts? Yes, a few of you. Right. Um, I've got um, about uh, sort of 45, 50 minutes, I think, to aiming to finish sort of 11 or or, or shortly after 11. Um, and uh, all I need to do is get out of the way. Um, right. Um, and what I'm going to, to try and do is um, right. Um, what I'm going to try and do in, in this talk is to. Um, present three different, uh, what, what I'm calling tools uh, for use in, in positive behaviour support work. Um, uh, one of them is focused on the use of positive behaviour support with individuals. Uh, one of them is focused on the organisational context within which uh, PBS is, is used. And one of them tries to go beyond the individual and look at the kinds of environments or the, the, uh, the capable environments within which challenging behaviour is, is uh, perhaps less likely. And you've got copies of all of the of the tools you should have on, on your, your seats. And you should also have a copy of the of the slides. Now um, it's quite a, a long time to talk without stopping and without some sort of engagement. We're not really in a position where we've been on much discussion in here, but I, I will I will pause after each tool uh, and give you the opportunity to comment or to ask questions relating to, to what we've been doing up to the end and to the, the, the nature of the tool and its possible uses and, uh, and, and so on. Um, so there will be opportunities to do that uh, and hopefully there will also be some opportunities at the end uh, for our questions or, or comments at that point. Um, these tools are, uh, they're, they're all ones that I've been involved in developing but there, there are also a whole range of other tools that I'm sure many or most of you will be familiar with. Um, through the, the PBS Academy in particular, uh, I've developed a range of tools for different groups of people, for different stakeholders, uh, including the PBS Competency Framework, which, which contains some of the material uh, that, 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 that relates very closely to some of the material that's, that's included in the tools that I'm going to present. Okay, so just to start with a, a, a very brief overview of challenging behaviour. Uh, I know you're all, I'm, sh I'm sure you're all very familiar with, with uh, challenging behaviour and with TBS. So I'm going to, this, this is going to be relatively brief before we get into uh, uh, stuff that's a bit more, more detailed. Um, challenging behaviour uh, occurs in context. Um, and it's very important to understand the immediate context within which uh, such behaviour occurs. Uh, I'm sure uh, this is the, the standard notion of, of the ABC, if you like, of behaviour, the antecedents and the consequences uh, surrounding behaviour. And, and we know that, that the, the events that immediately happen, that happen immediately before behaviour, and that happen immediately after behaviour, are very important in influencing uh, whether that behaviour is more or less likely to occur in the, in the future, in the kinds of circumstances within which it occurs. 
So that's very important. But one of the, the real features of PBX, one of its, its, uh, uh, its characteristics that takes it beyond some previous approaches to challenging behavior, is the way in which it, it doesn't just stop at looking at the immediate context within which challenging behavior occurs. It, it attempts to look at the broader context uh, of, of such behavior. And that broader context relates both to, to more general features of the individual, uh, for instance, their, their, uh, their physical health, their mental health, uh, perhaps the kind of genetic syndrome that they have, uh, uh, and, and also their, their more general uh, abilities or capacities, the extent to which they are able to communicate clearly, the extent to which they are able to control the environment around them, uh, and, and so on. Um, so, so PBS is, seeks to in its assessment processes to understand the individual uh, in a much broader way and to look at the way in which these sorts of characteristics may influence the occurrence of challenging behaviour. It also goes beyond the individual as well, and I'll come, come to that uh, later in the talk, uh, but it's very important, I think, to, to, to mention it here, and I, I should really put it on, on the slide as well, that, that PBS considers the broader social context within which challenging behaviour occurs. Um, thank you very much. Sorry, I <laughs> uh, If I pause, I'm going to pause in a minute and just have a little slough of that coffee. <laughs> um, I'll just finish the slide first. Um, Ted Carr, who was one of the pioneers of, of positive behavior support, an American psychologist, uh, said that the most important variable in PBS is systems change. In other words, if you, if, if you want to use PBS to understand and to have an impact on challenging behavior, you're in the business of changing systems, not just changing individuals, but changing systems. And that's, a, a, I think, one of the most important things that's ever been said about PBS, and, and it's important to, uh, we'll be coming back to that later and considering the broader social context within which challenging behavior happens. Now, anything I did in the last 10 seconds is going to be highly reinforced by the <laughs> Now I'm going to start by focusing um, on uh, the individual uh, and on the, the way in which PBS is uh, implemented at individual level and from working with individuals who display some kind of, of uh, challenging behavior, or behavior that describes as challenging. And these are just a, a number of the, the key features, if you like, of, of PBS. Now, there are, there are lots of different ways of, of presenting PBS, and there's nothing special about this one. I'm just using this, again, as, a, as an introduction to, to identify at least some of the key major components of, of this approach uh, to understanding and, and trying to have an impact on challenging behavior. Firstly, it's personalized. Um, it's still possible to find uh, uh, approaches to, to uh, trying to work with people with challenging behavior which aren't personalized, uh, which employ essentially the same approach across every individual or across the whole organization within which the individuals are, 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 are placed. Uh, so one very important feature of PBS is it's personalized. It, 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 it's adapted to the specific characteristics and needs of the individual. Uh, secondly, it's based, as we know, on a, a systematic functional assessment of the individual's behavior. And that, that assessment needs to go beyond just, as I've said already, the immediate context to consider the broader influences on the individual's behavior. Any uh, intervention that arises from that kind of assessment is going to incorporate uh, at least two, two kinds of, of approaches, proactive and reactive uh, support for the individual. And by proactive supports, we're talking about approaches that seek to prevent challenging behavior uh, or replace it with, with more adaptive uh, behavior that, that is successful at controlling the environment without the need to display challenging behavior. By reactive supports, I'm talking about, about the things that people do when challenging behavior happens. And PBS needs to take account of that as well. Uh, it needs to, to both incorporate approaches that will prevent challenging behavior uh, and will replace it, and incorporate approaches that will respond appropriately when such behavior actually happens. 
And the aims of PBS are to reduce challenging behavior and improve quality of life. Um, it's very easy to reduce challenging behavior. You, you can uh, do it very easily by, you, know, you can tie people up, you can put them in seclusion, you can, uh, you can give them loads of medication, you can knock them out. It's not, not difficult. Uh, what's difficult is, is reducing challenging behavior while improving quality of life. Uh, because all of those approaches, of course, that I've just described, will, will not just not improve quality of life, but they'll actively hamper and, and impair it. And of course, also positive behavior support seeks to avoid punishment and minimize restrictive uh, practices um, uh, as much as possible. So the, the, the whole focus of, of PBS is sometimes described as constructional. Uh, it's about, about building up new behaviors rather than uh, than, than a pathological approach which seeks to uh, get rid of existing behaviors. So there's nothing, I think, terribly new in, in that. Um, and then just very briefly, again, this is by way of background, why we should use PBS. Um, uh, there's now, I think, reasonable evidence to support the, the widespread use of, of PBS and work with people with learning disabilities as behaviors described as challenging. Um, it's the best evidence approach um, uh, in terms of, of, of published evidence in the, in the academic and professional literature. Uh, it's the best supported approach professionally. Uh, one of the most recent supports of that coming from the NICE guidelines that were published um, uh, last year uh, around uh, challenging behavior. Uh, and it's internationally endorsed. Uh, you'll find lots of PBS being used in the USA and Australia and in many other countries as well as the UK. Uh, so it's, it's, in a sense, an approach which has, has got uh, not just the evidence to it, but also got the, the weight behind it to, to, to hopefully implement it on a, on a much wider scale than it has been implemented up, up until now. So now come to the, the first tool. Um, and this uh, is helpfully headed to tool one. Uh, um, this, this tool was developed in the context of uh, uh, work following the original Transforming Care reports in, in the wake of Winterborne View, um, where the, the NHS wanted to develop a, what they described as a service specification, um, uh, which would incorporate uh, positive behavior support. And this was developed in that context, so it later emerged that my understanding of service specification and the NHS's understanding of one was slightly different, but that's not a story to walk into. Um, but the, this, the, the aim was to provide as clear a picture as, as possible of what it meant to talk about doing PBS with individuals. Um, and essentially, the, the, the main components of, of this tool are uh, describing what, what should be included in a written positive behavior support plan uh, that's based on assessment, uh, that specifies the challenging behavior that's being displayed and why it's being displayed, uh, and the approaches that are identified to prevent it and to replace it and to respond to it with built-in monitoring and review arrangements. So if you have a quick look at that, you'll see that, that there are two columns. Uh, the first column says what needs to happen. Uh, the second column says evidence that happened. And I'll just, I'll just mention just pick out one thing from this, perhaps. Um, uh, let's see if find something. Yeah, let's go to item um, six, implementation arrangements. Um, so the plan specifies any necessary characteristics for those implementing the strategy to strike. The plan specifies how many users will be trained to reliably and consistently implement strategies. And the plan specifies any additional or change resources required such as additional mediators or specific materials. So throughout, this is, this is attempting to give <coughs> as detailed a picture as possible of what it means to implement PBS with individuals from the starting process of identifying the behavior through to the, the, the end process of evaluating the extent, so item seven I think is about evaluation and monitoring, the extent to which um, uh, the, the plan has actually achieved its desired objectives. Now you can imagine a number of ways in which uh, a tool like this could be used. Um, it could be used in, um, in training 
uh, PBS practitioners. Uh, it can be used as a, as a kind of an audit tool to look at the practice of, of people who are apparently working in a PBS way. Uh, it can be used uh, to specify, perhaps by commissioners, the kinds of practices that a PBS service should engage in, and, and, and so on. So let me, let me just pause there and, and see in any comments or questions that arise from, from this, or, or this kind of our opportunity. The question, of course, is what's the function of the pause? <laughs> well done. Okay, right, I'll move on. Um, now, as part of that same process, uh, we also tried to uh, develop a picture of the kind of organizational arrangements that would be required to support this, this PBS approach. Because one of the, it's very clear, and I, I, I'm, I suspect those of you who are, who are engaged in PBS practice or have been engaged in the past are well aware of this. Uh, you can't implement PBS in a, in a vacuum or a, an organizational environment which is, which is opposed to it or which is, is just not supportive of, of what you're doing. Uh, probably the cleanest example of this is trying to implement PBS in, in an institution of some kind. Now, uh, unlike hopefully most of you, I've actually worked in an institution at the beginning of my career uh, a long time ago. I worked in a long stay hospital uh, and, and tried, PBS didn't exist at the time, but I tried to implement behavioral approaches with individuals and was eaten for breakfast by the, by the institution, really, by, and by its culture and by its, 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 uh, its, its established practices. Uh, which were so opposed to the kinds of characteristics I described earlier, for instance, things like being personalized, uh, that it was, it was impossible really to implement anything like um, the, the kinds of strategies that might be thought of as in PBS. So it's important to try and also specify the elements of the organizational uh, back, backdrop or culture uh, that are required in order to support this kind of PBS approach with individuals. And the next tool tries to uh, tries to do that, and these are some of the things that are uh, the, the sort of main headings that are in it. Um, and I'll, again, I'll pick up some of the detailed bits in, in, in a minute. So it's important that organisations take leadership uh, or ownership of PBS. Uh, you can't implement PBS by having, no matter how highly skilled the individual practitioners are, uh, if the organisation doesn't. Uh, doesn't own this, doesn't uh, lead uh, overall, uh, you're not going to get very far. Um, it's important that the organization is one that, that, that stresses user care and family involvement. The stakeholder involvement is a key component of, of, of PBS practice. It's important that it's a person-centered culture. Uh, PBS is a person-centered approach. You can't implement a person-centered approach within a culture that's not itself person-centered. It's important that, that uh, you've got acceptable physical environments that, that you know, you don't, don't have to have, it doesn't have to be a hotel, it could be a scout camp, but it's, it's, it's still got to be acceptable enough that, that uh, the, the uh, basic needs of life are, are being met before uh, something like PBS can be implemented. It's important that it, it's taking an act, that the organization more widely is taking an active support approach. Um, one of the reasons for that is that if you, if you are seeking to replace challenging behavior, then the kinds of things that you will be replacing it with in, in terms of work with individuals are, are likely to be uh, activities or skills or uh, taking part in, in, in becoming more independent. Uh, which, which, if actually the organization is not supporting those kinds of activities in its mainstream practices, it can be very difficult to divert an individual from challenging behavior into those kinds of alternatives. And you need to have trained, well-developed, deployed staff, data-driven practice, and a learning organization. 
And I'll come back to, to one or two of these things in a bit more um, detail. So if you have a look now at uh, tool two, <coughs> So this is very similar to the first tool, except it's focused uh, on the organization rather than, than work with the individual. So just let's just take the first item on there, provide leadership for and take ownership of the implementation of, of PBS. Uh, and again, there's evidence that this is happening. So what might be evidence that this is happening? Well, a clear written statement of policy and practice commitment to PBS. It's available to all staff and accessible to service users and family members. Uh, or, uh, and or, at least one member of the executive team or board a specific responsibility for organization-wide implementation of PBS. And or, at least one member of the executive team or board uh, has experience and training in using a PBS approach with individuals. So these are potential signs, if you like, that, that, that this organization, that any organization, is likely to support a PBS approach with individuals. <coughs> And maybe if you just look at one more, um, the uh, bottom one on that page, provide person-centered supports and services, uh, and some of the potential evidence uh, to, to support that within the organization. <coughs> services provided to individuals are clearly related to the needs and aspirations of those individuals and their families, friends, advocates. The organization can provide recent and checkable examples of having changed aspects of its provision in response to requests, complaints by individuals and their families, etc. The organization can provide recent and checkable <coughs> examples of having changed or audited aspects of its procedures uh, to adapt them to the needs and aspirations of individuals and their, uh, and their families, etc. Now, um, so, let, so let me pause there um, and any, any comments or questions relating to the, the use of this tool, and then I'll mention couple of potential uses if, if you haven't already mentioned them. How could this tool be used? Can I ask, if, are there any accreditation schemes that uh, will audit services against this kind of uh, tool? Well, that's clearly one way in which it could be, it could be used. Um, I'm not aware of a specific accreditation scheme that has used it in that kind of way, but it's been, I know it's been used, for instance, by commissioners um, to look at provider organizations and to try and consider whether uh, which of these provider organizations is best set up for, for uh, PBS. Um, I've used something very similar um, in reviewing the PBS policies uh, and uh, the written policies of a range of different organizations uh, and that was part of our uh, uh, a, a potential accreditation scheme, um, which I think, I think it was a CEVO or something, was, was trying to set up. I'm not sure whether it turned into an accreditation scheme or not, but clearly you could, you could imagine doing something that's all likely. Yeah, hopefully, the CQC were using this. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yep, yep. Mm -hmm. So, the last question, point three of the first section, my experience of executives. Um, and, and just see how you see that work in terms of point three, these one of the executive team have experience in training and using this approach. There's a bit of a chicken and egg cycle here as well because to have experience, the, the, the cultural organisation needs to sign up to PBS in the first place mm -hmm. and you're trying to then also bring the executives in so you can do that through recruitment but also in terms, in terms of the, it's about how do you think you bring, have you got ideas of how to bring those executives on board and do you envisage them doing Okay. Well, um, clearly, the uh, first, first important thing to say, I think, is that uh, uh, most organisations wouldn't uh, be close, really, to meeting the, 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 all the items of evidence that are in the right hand column here. Yeah. So you have to, I think, start by taking that as a given. Um, second thing, that so, so you're working towards something. You're, you're setting out a vision of of what is uh, of an aspiration, if you like, rather than a, uh, something that's, that's real just now. Then the second thing is, is how, do you, how do you move towards that, uh, that vision? Um, there are some organizations that have got members of executive teams who have got background in, in PBS or related approaches. So it's not, it's not completely off the wall that you might have someone in, in that position. If you don't, then, then I think you start from where you are and you say, right, okay, how can we, how can we move 
this organisation more towards that? Can, is there, for instance, someone within the organisation who might be promoted to board level, mm -hmm. or can we work with people who are already at board level mm -hmm. and, and support them to be trained and so on? Mm -hmm. Very similar thing happens in active support training, which, which uh, some of my colleagues are heavily involved in, uh, Julie Beadle Brown and, and colleagues in particular, where, where they, they, they never carry out training of frontline staff without first doing training with, with uh, managed managers and leaders of the organisation. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the managers and leaders of the organisation are, are getting their hands dirty and actually working with individuals. But at the very least, they're getting uh, some insight into what this, this approach is about and they're in a position to understand it and support it within uh, their organisation. Can I ask a question about training? Mm -hmm. um, so, so we completely, this is similar to the, the Academy um, competency framework. So in our organisation, we are now getting asked by commissioners to complete this before mm -hmm. we go to services. So, mm -hmm. so we've done that and mm -hmm. a lot of it is aspirational where we want to be. We're not getting it all, all right. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that came up for us recently was around um, what do we define as PBS training? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, in, in one of our areas um, that my colleague is part of is that we're getting offered training from, from an NHS board, and it's one day training, and you know, we're almost being told as a voluntary organisation, you have to do this training, because this is what we're saying is PBS training. But then when we actually looked into it, um, it, 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 it wouldn't be remotely even awareness level of PBS training. So I'm a little bit worried about this. There's a lot of organisations popping up using the term PBS training. Is there a piece of work that needs to be done that actually quantifies that? Very long yes, I think I, I, I think the PBS Academy are, are yeah. trying to do something in, yeah. around this in terms of standards, um, uh, which would include standards that are, are required of training um, as well. Um, so I, th I think there's some. I mean, what 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 this <coughs> tries to do is, is try to um, identify some of the components of training that are are important. So, for instance, it talks about training which includes practice-based assignments and independent assessment of performance. So it so identifies some components that might help to uh, provide more confidence and more reassurance that this is, this is proper training and, and it's likely to be useful training. I entirely agree, but there's a lot of, I mean, one, one of the things that almost inevitably happens when you're, you know, if you go, PBS has become, has, has, Become much more popular in the last five years, essentially. Um, now, one of the things that inevitably happens then is that, is that things get relabeled, and the things that were already happening get relabeled as PBS. And uh, I've certainly seen, I've read organisation policies where that's clearly happened, because they're, what they're describing is nothing like my understanding of PBS, but they're calling it PBS. Uh, but also, training gets, you know, gets developed by individuals who perhaps don't necessarily have much in the way of background or organisations that don't have much in the way of background. So these things are bound to happen, I think. And, 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 but it is, you're right, there is a, a need for some kind of standards and I hope the PBS Academy will develop that, uh, that can allow some discrimination between better and uh, less good training. Okay, let me move on and uh, back to that. Now, um, let, me, let me give you a little story at this point, um, which I know, because uh, I know at least a few of you will have before, so apologies for that, but hopefully most of you won't have had that. This is a, a story, it's, uh, it's, it's not based on a real individual, it's based on a range of different experiences uh, with, with individuals. Uh, so this is a, a, a person, let's call him John, who uh, uh, goes to a, a kind of a day centre or shelter workshop or something like that and, and works there and he's got severe learning disabilities, didn't communicate very well, um, but he seems to like the, the, the work that he does there. Um, but usually uh, after a while um, he, he begins to get a bit agitated and sometimes he gets a bit aggressive when he bangs his uh, fists on the desk and, uh, and, and so on. So the, the day centre calls in um, a PBS practitioner um, who can be, if you want, a psychologist or not, or whatever, uh, who comes along and who, who uh, looks at what's going on and, and carries out uh, uh, an assessment, a functional assessment. And 
Uh, following that, the process of functional assessment, their conclusion is that, that John is displaying this behavior uh, because he wants a break from work. Um, he likes the work, but he, he, he gets fed up with it after a while and he wants, wants a break and to go outside of the, the center. Um, so the PBS practitioner sets up an intervention, um, which is based on, on what's sometimes called functional communication training. Um, so you teach the person to uh, make a communication response that other people then respond to appropriately. So they teach John to, to use a sign um, for wanting a break. And this goes really well. Uh, there's a key worker who works with John who he gets on with quite well, and the key worker picks up the approach really quickly. And uh, within a few weeks, John's no longer displaying any difficult behavior. And usually after an hour and a half or two hours, he'll use his sign um, and he goes out for 10 minutes with his key worker and he comes back in and it's all fine and dandy. Then, a couple of weeks later, um, the PBS practitioner gets a phone call. Uh, John's uh, behaviour has got worse again. Uh, what's happening? Um, he goes in, PBS practitioner goes along, finds out the key worker is, is off sick. Um, and uh, other staff from across the centre have been brought in to work with John, uh, but uh, they don't know uh, the programme, as it were. Uh, John's using his sign, they're not responding to it, uh, they're not letting him go and take a break, and so John's becoming challenging again. Um, so the, the PBS practitioner um, starts doing some work with the other staff and sets up a training programme, sets up some procedures, of course, this all takes time, and in the meantime, John gets excluded from the, from the day centre. Uh, but a few weeks later, uh, things are set up, John comes back, the staff now understand the programme, all hunky-dory again, uh, the behaviour goes away, so great. However, um, a few weeks later, um, another phone call, uh, challenging behaviour happening again. Uh, PBS practitioner goes along to the day centre, uh, and finds out that John's no longer getting his breaks. Why is he no longer getting his breaks? Well, um, the local authority uh, has decided that the function of the day centre is now going to be to promote supported employment, and as a result, they've, um, uh, they've put in fixed break times, um, so that people aren't allowed to just leave when they want to, they have fixed break times, because that's how, how factories and offices work, and. That's, that's going to get people ready for, for, for open employment. Uh, so of course John's using his sign, doesn't get his break um, uh, because it's not the right time. Um, so a bit of a problem, he starts to behave challenging again and he gets excluded from the centre. PBS practitioner talks to the manager of the centre. The manager understands but um, isn't able to do anything about it because this is the new local authority policy. Uh, so. PBS practitioner goes and talks to a local authority, talks to their human resources department, eventually persuades them that actually John is disabled and that this is a reasonable adjustment. Uh, that if you, can, if you can allow him to take a break at different times, that's a reasonable adjustment given his disabilities. Um, so it's okay to do this. So goes back to the centre, gets it all going again, John comes back, everything settles down. Now, of course, you know, this story could go on and on. You can, I, I'm sure it's a few more layers to this. But, but you can see the point, I think. And the point is that challenging behaviour doesn't belong to the individual. Um, it, it seems as though it does because it's the individual who's doing the behaviour. Um, but, it, but challenging behaviour occurs in context. And it occurs not just in the context of the immediate supports and interactions that are around the person, but also in terms of the, the, the setting practices and culture, uh, whether that be a classroom, a group home, uh, a workplace, uh, and the organisational policies and procedures that surround uh, and support uh, that, that setting. Um, and all of those components of the environment may be components that, uh, that make challenging behaviour more likely, uh, or they may be components that make challenging behaviour less likely. Uh, they may be, in a sense, features of a, of a challenging or a capable environment. So any approach, really, to any comprehensive approach um, to uh, using PBS uh, has to take account of a whole system understanding uh, and has to approach 
challenging behaviour, thinking about the system as a whole, not just about the individual. It's John's the one that gets excluded here. Um, uh, actually, the, the problems in, this, in, in, that, in that example are uh, in the organisation, in the practices of the organisation, rather than in, in John's behaviour. John's just behaving the same as he does all the time. Uh, that's, not, that's not changing. And so it's very important to, to, to uh, take this broader picture of, um, of, of what might need to change. So that brings us uh, to a, a first tool, which I'll just look at in a minute. And um, the third tool is about defining a capable environment, um, or identifying the characteristics of a capable environment. A capable environment is, is a context which supports capable behaviour and discourages uh, challenging behaviour. Um, it's based on a sound understanding of the causes of challenging behaviour. Uh, it recognises challenging behaviour as a problem of the system, not just of the individual. Uh, and it, it's based on the notion of, of and the ability to intervene across the system, not just with the individual. And the whole focus is on improving the quality of care, support and treatment that individuals might receive. So if you have a look at tool three, now what you've got here is four columns, uh, a number of characteristics down the left hand side, then a statement of what each characteristic involves, then a, a bit about why this is important, and then finally some illustrative evidence. So we take just the first one on here, uh, positive social interactions. What does this involve? Um, carers like the person and interact uh, frequently with them in ways that the person enjoys and understands. Why is this important? In situations where the person receives unconditional positive social interactions, they are less likely to display challenging behaviour to obtain social interaction. I will read the whole thing. We all know um, from, from uh, research on functional assessment that uh, attention is a, a key function of challenging behaviour. Uh, a fair bit of challenging behaviour is displayed uh, as a way of obtaining uh, attention. That relates clearly to this, from, and, and the point of this, and the reason why positive social interactions are clearly important, uh, is, is because they, they provide a context within which challenging behaviour, which is about obtaining attention, is much less likely, because the person's already receiving lots of positive social interactions from, from those around them. Now, technically, uh, uh, and so this is about modifying uh, what sometimes called establishing operations or motivating operations, um, but less technically, it's just about providing an environment that's, that's uh, creates the conditions for the individual uh, in which they're less likely to display challenging behaviour. And there are a range of, of then additional uh, items. Um, perhaps just mention one more uh, on the second page. Uh, consistent predictable environments which honour personalised routines and activities. Um, what does this mean? Care or support the person consistently so that the person's experience is similar, no matter who is providing the support. Um, carers use a range of communication and other approaches to ensure that the person understands as much as possible what's happening around them. Why is this important? Challenging behaviour is more likely when the person is supported inconsistently or when the transition between one activity uh, and another activity or environment. Most people value consistent and predictable support. This is very basic stuff in a sense, but you, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware that uh, if you go to uh, many social care or other sorts of environments, you will find inconsistency, uh, you will find lack of predictability, uh, you will find personal routines not being honoured. In other words, you'll find an environment which is much more challenging than it is capable in terms of, of, of this respect. Any, any comments or questions arising from this tool or suggested uses for this, this, this tool? Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. We've been um, using this to in one of our services um, and we used the same format apart from at the end rather than illustrative evidence. Uh -huh. We asked the teams what was working and what wasn't working. Uh -huh. So here's some of the things that are important. Tell me what's right for the person that you're working with and what's wrong. And how do we change what's not working into what's working. Um, and it was an effective way of 
get people who maybe don't know as much about people and barriers to, to see them. Mm -hmm. you know, Right, right. So you're using it in the sense of two two ways. One is like kind of an audit, yep. um, or a, a, perhaps a, almost, almost like a self audit, a self assessment. And secondly, then is an improvement tool, the way of saying that, okay, mm -hmm. how, how can we improve performance in this particular area? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And they were working alongside somebody who was maybe more specialist in PBS. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. if they couldn't see some of the areas where it wasn't working, then we could provide a little bit of feedback for them right. in order to understand them a bit more why like, like it wasn't working. Like trading as well, in the sense of trading to Okay, right. Um, just, just one yeah, minute. Sorry. Could, could you use this to sort of see what's in place before you do a full functional assessment to make sure the basics are set yes, before you yes, actually do yes. the lots of piece of work? Mm -hmm. I, I think you could, and I, I think that would be quite a useful thing to do. I mean, clearly, you don't want to spend months, you know, doing that sort of you know, comprehensive evaluation of every every environment you're working in. But getting a, getting a sense of the, uh, the interactions that people have with their, their carers or supporters, uh, whether there's, there's a, a rapport between the individual. Uh, and when one of uh, Maria's here, um, Maria did a PhD on rapport at the Tizar Center, which is the interaction between uh, individuals and their, and their carers. Uh, the extent to which there are opportunities for choice and so on. I think you can get a, get a, a reasonable picture of that, all that sort of stuff fairly quickly, and it can then uh, inform the extent to which you, you focus on, for instance, uh, a, a more general improvement strategy uh, than a more technical, um, functional, or behavioural strategy in, in the work that you then do. Okay. Um, now, I, I want to um, just sort of finish off you know, by uh, talking a little bit about, just very briefly, about a research project that we uh, have done recently at uh, the Tivar Centre, um, and which has used this kind of approach in the sense that, especially the, the last one, the, the notion of capable environments and, uh, and trying to make environments more capable. Um, so th this was an approach which was carried out as, as a research project. It was funded by uh, the School for Social Care Research uh, in collaboration with Dimensions, which is, I think, is probably some people from Dimensions here today. Um, uh, and uh, the main researchers were Leah Bonono, Emmett Smith, and Will Clover, um, uh, the latter two working for Dimensions. Um, and what we attempted to do was to, to uh, improve the quality of social care within a number of settings within dimensions with a view to, to seeing if that would reduce challenging behaviour. Um, and we did that by, first of all, developing a structure model of social care, which I'll show you in a minute, but which is actually very similar to the capable environment <coughs> that I've just, uh, just looked at. Secondly, it being goals or standards, so things that could be changed. Um, in, in each of those, those categories of, of social care. Thirdly, providing support training and monitoring and feedback to staff in those settings to help them to achieve the standards. Uh, and all putting this all together, essentially, it, 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 it could be thought of as being a kind of setting-wide or system-wide positive behaviour support. This was the model of social care. Um, again, you see the headings are very similar to the headings on the, on the capable environments and the communication, social interaction, health, activities, and skill development. To the extent what, what this does is it combines some of the categories that are in the, in the capable environments uh, and uh, just to make it a bit more manageable in terms of, the, of this particular project. And, and, and these, these reflect, all of these uh, areas of social care reflect areas where there are, there's clear evidence for a relationship with challenging behaviour. So for instance, uh, my case study from earlier, my example from earlier, illustrates the relationship between communication difficulties and challenging behaviour. Of course, uh, social care environments are often not very good at promoting communication uh, amongst the individuals that they, they serve. And they're also not very good at communicating to individuals um, so that people don't know what's going on. And we worked with a, this was kind of as a randomized controlled trial, 
uh, with uh, the 11 settings in the experimental group, and the settings were all either residential care, homes, or supported living settings, where there were some individuals displaying behavior described as challenging, and some individuals who, who didn't display such behavior. And the, we used a measure called the Aberrant Behavior Checklist to evaluate the change in challenging behavior. Uh, time one was baseline before the project started. Time two was after intervention, so about, about three months after uh, intervention. And time three was about 18 months later, uh, 18 months later follow up. And the blue line here is the experimental settings, the settings where we, where we intervened, and the red line is the control group where we didn't intervene. And as you can see, the substantial reduction in challenging behavior within the experimental group, um, uh, which we lost some of at follow-up, but, but still at follow-up, we've got a, a, a significant difference between the level of challenging behavior originally and the final level of challenging behavior, and also between the experimental and the control group. Right. So this seems like an approach that um, uh, can have an impact on challenging behavior. But it's not a, you know, the, going back to the beginning of this presentation, I talked first about uh, an individually focused approach to PBS. And undoubtedly, this sort of approach that I've just described just now isn't an alternative to that. Um, but hopefully it's an addition, potentially. It's a way of, of creating the kinds of, of context within which there's less challenge, individual challenging behavior to deal with, and the challenging behavior that is there to deal with is rather easier to deal with because the culture is now much more, uh, ex, much more accepting of that kind of approach and, and much more likely to adopt and implement it uh, properly and correctly across, uh, uh, across the, both the individual and the rest of the setting. Some additional information if, if you want to follow up anything. Um, the research project was more on our web pages at the Tisnoff Centre. Uh, the capable environments, that table, there's a, a slightly longer document that includes that table at that, at that link. Um, and there's a, a visual of the capable environment notion that Mark Dorman has developed, which is available at, at that link. So uh, happy to take any, any questions or comments if we've got time, if we've got time. Yeah, we've got five minutes. Yeah, right, okay. So, five minutes if that anyone's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, how do you see um, what the project and how long is the one for? Right, okay. Um, we uh, started in um, 2012. Um, we, the, the follow up data were collected last year, in 2016. Um, so the, the, the original project lasted um, for uh, was it two and a half years, I think, um, and the intervention itself, so, so basically we started in 2012, we intervened in 2013, we collected the, the time two information, 2013-2014, and then 2016 we uh, collected the, the follow-up information. And the, the there's more detailed information on that link, but it's also currently being written up for you to, to the publication. Mm -hmm. Was your experimental and your control group within the same service? Or two no, services? no. Uh, it was designed as a, what's called a cluster randomized control trial, which means that um, because you, could, you couldn't intervene, because it's a setting wide approach, you couldn't really inter couldn't intervene with one individual and not intervene with another individual. You actually you got to intervene with everyone. So we identified some houses or residential settings, and they were in the experimental group, and other houses <coughs> of, of residential settings were in the control group. And that was the way we, we did it. So, so most of, the, very little of the work was actually focused on individuals at all. I mean, we didn't we. We didn't know a great deal about the individuals. Uh, we, we, most of the work was, was carried out through staff and through managers and through uh, the organisation rather than, than actually direct within the individuals. So for instance, let me give you an example. Um, uh, let's go back to uh, um, and take, take the communication stuff. Um, now, uh, we found uh, many examples uh, in the residential settings where um, there was no way, uh, I mean I mentioned this earlier so it's a bit of a repeat, but there's no way that, that 
the people uh, using the service could understand what was happening. Uh, they, there were no, there was, for instance, settings where there were no visual timetables or <coughs> no predictable routines. So what, what we did was we worked with the setting to develop those kinds of, of timetables and routines, um, which, which they could then adapt to specific individuals if that was necessary. But, but the fundamental intervention was getting that, that in place more generally, rather than saying, well, okay, what does this specific individual need? And then uh, everybody in the setting, both those who presented challenging behavior and those who didn't, would hopefully be in a better position to know what was happening next and, and to understand uh, uh, the extent to which they were able to engage in preferred activities and, and things like that. How big was your um um, there were 11 residential settings in the experimental group, which uh, made up, I think, 38 individuals with learning disability. There were 13 residential settings in the control group, which made up 40, I think 43 individuals with, with learning disability. Um, so, you, I mean, a relatively small study um, and undoubtedly needs more replication and so on to, to look at it, but it's, it's consistent with. In, in the States, there's been a lot of work on what's called school-wide positive aid support. Um, so working in, in uh, both special and ordinary schools and trying to reduce the level of, of difficult behavior in those schools, not just through working with individuals, but through looking at, at the, the rules that are in operation across the schools, uh, the, the culture they operate, the way in which they record problems arising and, and so on. So a similar kind of approach to the, uh, and, and that was a source of, of some of the ideas for what we were trying to do in, in, in social care settings for all online schools. So I think there's, and, and that's been a very effective approach in, in schools, so there's, there's reason to believe that it's potentially think, applicable uh, in social care settings as well. Okay, I think we're going to Okay, right. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll say thank you to Peter for a very